One God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We thank Allah for his coming and for blessing us with a divine leader, teacher, and guide, the messenger of Allah, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. To you, my brothers and sisters, it is again a great honor and privilege to be able to meet with you to study and to discuss the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man who made, in our judgment, the most powerful impact on black America of any leader or teacher to ever come among us. And because of the power of Messenger Elijah Muhammad's impact on black America, we who love him, we who are devoted to his teachings, felt that we could not sit idly by and watch his work destroyed, his name dragged in the mud, to see a great movement, a great teaching, a great teacher thrown away when our people are more in need of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad represented today than we were when he was present among us. And so we feel that as students of his and as disciples of his, that it is fitting and proper that we invite our people to study what he taught. Since he left us with 40 years of labor, a powerful example for the world to see, and many, many words, books, tapes, we have a lot to study. So we're not inviting you necessarily to hear Brother Farrakhan, a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but we are inviting you to an independent study of the man himself, his words, and you make the judgment as to whether what he teaches is valid for you and me and our families and our people. What we love about the study discussion group is that it lays no obligation on anyone. Now we've tried um, certain chemicals that white folks have put on the market and they say if you try it and in 14 days if you don't have clearer, smoother, brighter skin you may return the unused portion and you will get your money back. Well, since we're not asking any money for the course, all we're asking is for your time. Not just your time here on a Thursday night, but we're asking if you would purchase the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's book and then go home and give yourself 15 minutes a day to read, to study, to analyze what this man is saying. Then we come back together in a group and share our thoughts, our sentiments, our feelings about what he said. Now, before I ask you to get into the discussion, there's something that I wanted to read to you and take about 10 minutes to discuss with you from the Holy Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims. Every time you turn on your radio or your television today, you hear something about Muslims. If it's in Afghanistan fighting the Russians, 
or in Iran um, opposing the American uh, government's policies there or Saudi Arabia or the Muslims inside China, inside Russia or all over the world. So Islam is making an impact and we have heard more in the last 60 days since the Americans have been held hostage in Iran about Islam thank you, than we have heard in the last 60 years. It was an unwritten and in many cases a secretly written code that Islam was not to be discussed with black people. If it is discussed, it must be discussed in secret societies, fraternal orders, masons, shriners, but they are sworn to secrecy that they should not tell anybody anything of what goes on in their lodge. Now, George Washington the first president of the United States made it a law that Islam and the Quran should never be taught among black people. And the fact that the first president of the United States made it against the law for us to study Islam and the fact that the first president of the United States came to power when we were yet enslaved or coming up out of slavery just a few days but were yet in a form of bondage their knowledge of Islam their knowledge of what Islam did with black people in Africa and their knowledge of what those black people in Africa under Islam did in Europe to the Europeans in wars made them to know that if you got a hold to this Quran, Islam, it would bring out of you things that are dormant within you that they know are there. Your militant nature, your natural leaning toward righteousness and justice. Once that is brought out of you and you learn to fear God alone and nobody else, then your chains are broken. Because white folks understood that the only way they can keep us a slave is to keep us ignorant and to keep us afraid to search beyond them for greater knowledge. So I'd like to just read to you from the 96th chapter of the Quran. If you don't have a Quran with you, that's all right. In a few days, we'll all have a Quran and we will go through some studies in this book also. These are the first words that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Arabian prophet heard. And it's, the chapter is called Al-Alakh, the clot. The clot. It reads, In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Read, In the name of thy Lord, who creates. Creates, man from a clot read and thy Lord is most generous who taught by the pen taught man what he knew not nay man is surely inordinate because he looks upon himself as self-sufficient now let us look at those few words a moment. To those sisters who have had children, 
you know that as the baby is forming in the womb, it starts from the sperm mixed with ovum, then there's a cell that forms. And then as those cells multiply, you get a clot. If for some reason there's a miscarriage, if you ever see that miscarriage in that clot form, it's a very ugly thing. How many of you have ever seen a clot of blood that is the beginning of new life? How many? May I see your hands if you've seen it? Any brothers seen it? Okay. Well, sisters, will you bear me witness? It's quite an ugly sight, isn't it? But yet, in that, there's life growing. Right? Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, as a clot is ugly because it is life forming, but the life has not yet formed, so are a people considered ugly when they are illiterate or ignorant, unable to read and write. There's great beauty there in the people, but that beauty has to be developed and formed. And the way that beauty comes to a people is through giving a people what? Knowledge. Would you agree? Now look how beautiful your faces are. Look how handsome our faces are. But that's not real beauty in the human being. The real beauty of a human being is never external. The real beauty of a human being is that which emanates from within. And that which emanates from within is only cultivated by the gaining of knowledge. America has a large percentage of its population that is illiterate. Would you agree? In our lessons, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asks the question, why does the devil keep our people illiterate? And the answer is, so that he can use us as a tool and also a slave. Once somebody can keep you from reading, they keep you from searching out the real truth that is hidden. Because everything that you would want to know is in a book somewhere. But if you don't know where to look, and worst of all, don't want to look, then keeping you and me in that state makes us easy to control, easy to master, and very easy to make a slave. Now, most of us grew up in church. But how many of us have taken the time to read? The Bible. I haven't got time. I don't want to read no Bible. So because we don't want to read Scripture, we permit preachers to read it for us. Suppose he hasn't read it right. Suppose he's misquoting it. Suppose in his heart there is a disease and he wants to misuse you through religion. You sit there, you don't pay any attention to reading the book, to trying to understand the book, so somebody who has halfway read it can take you on a journey that maybe you didn't want to travel on. So the time is out, brothers and sisters, for us to let any leader, any preacher, any teacher do our reading for us. Would you agree that if we are not going to be deceived by any man ever again, 
we must do what for ourselves? Now, I know we are lazy, but we're just going to have to get out of that habit of being an oral people that listen to people speak, but we refuse to read, to analyze, and to study for ourselves. So the Quran starts with Muhammad saying, read in the name of thy Lord who creates, creates man from a clot. You are ugly in ignorance, but you are beautiful in knowledge if you exercise that knowledge. Now, why are the black people of America and the world in such pitiful shape? It's largely because we don't read. And when we do read, we don't try to read with understanding, read with a critical eye, listen with a critical ear. Now, if we don't do anything tonight but to establish this principle that whenever you read, take no thing that you read as face value, it's all right. No, read critically, read analytically. Would you agree? Now, sometimes you trust people, and that's good. But in today's world, that's not too good at all. Because today's friend is tonight's enemy. So what your friend tells you today, don't take it for face value, analyze it and check it out. Now, I visited Cuba a few years ago as the guest of the Cuban government. And what I saw really amazed me. In the few short years that Fidel Castro had been the leader of the Cuban people, they had almost eradicated illiteracy from the Cuban people. When Castro took over, the literacy rate in Cuba was something like maybe 20 to 25 percent of the people were literate, meaning they could read and write. By the time I visited Cuba, the literacy rate was nearly 98 percent. Now, to me, brothers and sisters, that is the sign of great leadership. When you make your people able to read, to write, to think, to analyze, you are putting your people on a firm foundation that no one will be able to uproot them from. And those of us who are interested in seeing black people rise from the grave of ignorance understand that our people have to be forced to read. Now, if you go home tonight, you look at your television news, right? Most of us get our news from where? TV or radio. Many of us, how many of us read a newspaper every day? Okay. Brothers and sisters, get in the habit of reading a newspaper every day. You would be surprised if you read the Chicago Tribune, read the Sun-Times, read the Daily Defender, and read another paper from another city just to see how news is reported in different papers. It gives you some idea of how news is managed. And if you don't learn how to read and analyze 
they'll have you going in the wrong direction thinking that you're going in the right direction. So, beloved brothers and sisters, everything that we want to know is where? In a book. And if you really want answers, you have to seek. So what did Jesus say? Seek and you shall find. If you're not looking for nothing, what are you going to find? All right. But every black person wants answers. Everyone that's here tonight is looking for some kind of answer. We contend that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was given the answers by God for us to go on and solve our problems. And all we're asking you to do is read and analyze what he says. And if you find what he says to be correct, then act on the principles of what he teaches starting tonight. Okay, now we open message to the black man. If you don't have a book, would you share it with your neighbor? And there are some message to the black man's that we have here tonight. If you don't have it, then you may get it. When we left off the last time, we asked the question, is God a spirit or a man? Is God a spirit or a man? It's a very powerful question. How many of you read this section? Did you make any notes while you read? You did? I would like to hear from you some of the notes that you made as you read that short passage. Is God a spirit or a man? Would, would, would anybody like to share with us the notes that they made? Even if the notes are critical, whatever the notes are, this is what we are here for, to discuss it. Would anyone like to share with us the notes that they made on that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I had uh, God a spirit of man, and up under that said, A, God is a man. B, we should not be fooled concerning the will of God. C, the truth of the real knowledge of the devil has been revealed. D, relief is, is, is in sight. E, now is the time for the salvation of our people. The whole third chapter of Habakkuk is devoted to the coming and work of God against our enemies. We should not take our enemies for our spiritual guide, lest we stumble and fall with them. Now, did anyone else make any notes on that? Listen to what she said. She picked those right out of that work. And what she said is a very a very potent word that we can spend the whole night just analyzing. Now let us go into that. Yes, brother, did you make some notes? Please. Yes, sir. In this section, on page 13, the Bible says, Behold, the question is raised, are we living in a material universe or a spirit universe? And it says we are material beings in a material universe. I think that this question is a question that it's a question of philosophy, I think. And uh, I think that uh, it's hard to answer that question in terms of whether it's material or, 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 or spirit. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the people that I know, their whole they base their actions and their, their living off of their concerns and the answers to that question. For example, many people feel that, see this question to me uh, touches 
on, on how all of this came about. The Big Bang Theory versus a creator. Okay, so I, I think that this uh, question is very significant and I would like you to uh, delve into it in more detail because philosophically I think that this question is what helps people to behave like they do. And just to draw it out a little bit more, <coughs> most individuals that I know who subscribe to a particular religion, okay, they are of the view that, well, there's nothing we can really do about all of this ourselves, but we have to put it, it's in the hands of somebody else. And, and hand in hand with that, that philosophy is the philosophy that all of this was created in the universe, okay? Um, whereas alternatively, you have individuals who believe that it evolved, that the hand of history is the hand of man, that we will have to do certain things to change all of this. So, you know, I'm trying to... Yes, I, I, I hear you. I hear you, my dear brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I would like to get some more comments before I say anything. Because this is our class. I would, does anyone else want to offer a comment? No. Does anyone want to offer a comment? Sister, what was your last point that you made? The whole third chapter of Habakkuk was devoted to the coming and work of God against our enemies. We should not take our enemies for our spiritual guides, lest we stumble and fall with them. All right. Now, the third chapter of Habakkuk, which is in the Bible, is dealing with the coming of God to work for the deliverance of a people. But I think the most important point that is raised there is we should not take our enemies for our spiritual guides. Now that may seem like a very simple statement. But brothers and sisters, listen. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, if a man will not treat you right, will that man teach you right? And what is your answer? If a man mistreats you and taught you right, what he taught you would condemn him and his actions and soon everybody would be on his case. Is that right? So your common sense should let you know that if a people will not treat you right, that people will not teach you right. Now here's where we make a mistake. White folks on a general level mistreat us. But at the same time, out of the people who mistreat us, there's a man dressed in a robe and a collar and he comes to us as a God-fearing man and we take him as our spiritual guide. True? Billy Graham. And that kind of individual who black people look at as really the very epitome of righteous conduct. But he's from a people who have put us under and keep us under. Now, if he has no effect on his people to get them to do simple justice by us, by the Indians, by the oppressed people of the world, then how can you justify taking such one as your spiritual guide? Your common sense should lead you to believe that the reality of divine teaching is probably just the opposite of what you've been taught all your life. 
Now we could go into this very, very deeply, but this is neither the time nor the place. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, brother, asked that question, do we live in a material world or do we live in a spirit world? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in my judgment, was trying to get us to see this. Spirit represents, if you break the word down, the energy of life. The spirit is always here. But spirit is not independent of matter. You have spirit, but you are also matter. And the spirit is generated through matter and is made manifest through matter. So we see the sun. It's material. We know that there is a law that governs it that is spirit that we don't see. We see the moon, we see the sun, the stars, we see the things that the creator created. So everything that you can see, touch and feel, and there are things that you cannot see, such as the air, but it is also matter. You can't see the atom, but it is also matter. But in that matter, there is energy. So what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is trying to get us as a people to see is that we are material beings in a material universe. We have spirit. Spirit generates the life of this matter. Right? But you can't divorce the matter from the spirit nor the spirit from the matter because they need each other. Now, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad makes us to understand that there is no mystery God, that things just don't happen, there is a cause that produces every effect. So when someone says, Oh, well, the conditions of the world, they're terrible. They're awful. God will make a way. Well, that's nice. But that's excusing a lazy bum from his or her duty in this life to make life better. Now, listen. If your room is dirty, you can say, well, God will clean it up. <laughs> but in reality, if you don't get a broom, the dirt will continue to... ...pile up around you and me because that's in your realm and you can take care of that. Is that right? All right. Now, if our condition in America is such that God will take care of it and we've been waiting on God to take care of it since our fathers came into America, God will take care of it. And we are in worse shape in 1979 in many respects than we were a hundred years ago because some of those slaves knew that they had something to do with their problem. And what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is driving at, he says, God is real. There's a realm that he functions on that you can't function on because we don't know what he knows. But he's taking care of his work in his realm, but you got a realm that you can function in and that you should not leave to no mystery God. For instance, you can get up and make 
a job for yourself. You shouldn't wait on God to do it. Come on. You didn't wait on God to come and make the baby for you. <laughs> you understood that there was something on this realm that you had to take care of. And you enjoyed taking care of your business. Excuse me for putting it like that. But that's the same kind of joy we should have on our own realm of moving the obstacles that we can move that stand in the way of our progress as a people. God, as the Quran teaches us, my brother, it says he will never change the condition of a people until they change it themselves. Now, what does that mean? God will help you. All the tools are out here for you to use. But if you don't get up, use your brain, use your hands, go get knowledge, unite with your brother who is oppressed like yourself, and then figure out a plan of action, and then deal according to that plan of action, we'll be here another hundred years waiting on God to do for us what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says we can do for ourselves. Now, this does not negate the spirit, but what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wants us to see is that our spiritual guides, meaning white folks, They've gotten black folks' minds so messed up thinking about God doing everything for us and we sit around and allow the white man to think for us, to plan for us, to build for us, to make jobs for us. And as long as we allow him to do that, we'll always be the slave and he'll always be the master. One last point. Do you know... It takes a lot of mental energy to think out of this sphere. If I tell you that heaven is way out there beyond the sun, moon, and star, and I paint this imaginary picture of this great heaven, for you to think on that heaven, I mean, think on how beautiful it is, golden streets, and with the price of gold as it is on the earth? I mean, can you think about golden streets and pearly gates? And Oh, man, you'll be thinking and thinking. And the more you think out of this realm, the less control you have of this realm. So if you notice in any kind of physical encounter, whether it's boxing, if it's karate or whatnot, if a man can fake you out of your position by making you think that the blow is coming from here and you react, then you open yourself up and you get popped. The moment white folks took our minds off of the reality of here and put us in the imaginary there, then we lost control of here because we wasn't thinking about here no more. Now that we can't have that. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teaching is to go out and snatch your mind from wherever it is out there in space and bring it home and let you start functioning and thinking about you, your family, your community, your people. And when the thought power, energy of your thinking is concerned with your immediate problems, you'll be able to solve those problems that you can solve and then leave to God those things that only he can solve. But not all things, just the things that you can't handle. All right? Now, anyone else have any notes? Who, who made notes? May I see your hands? Anyone that made notes? All right then. Now, I don't want to miss most of the class is missing this. All right, maybe we'll read. But I really wanted to move tonight. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go right on and do the pages that we said we were going to do, then come back. All right? Did anyone make any notes on the coming of God? 
the coming of God. Do you look for the coming of God to be a spirit or do you look for this God who comes to be able to be seen? What does the book say about that? Anyone make any notes? Uh oh. Well, I'm going to say this again tonight. That when you read a chapter, what I would love for you to do is read it with a pencil. And when you come across something that strikes a thought in your mind, positive or negative, write it down. So that when we come to the class, we can discuss it. I see a hand. Yes, brother. That's exactly what I did, brother. Very good. Then do you have any thoughts on this a chapter on page 7 the coming of God is he a man or a spirit did you make any notes on that at all well I, I went to the scripture that uh, you referred me to yes sir he did bear witness of uh, the coming of, of God or from a mountain Mount Carmel yes Okay, now, let us, I'm going to just uh, read a paragraph and then I'd like you to read. Yes, sir, would you like to make a comment? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. I don't have to have my notes with me, but I don't know if That's fine. You'll come straight from work with it. However, uh, in the coming of God, to say a lot of times, you know, what I got out of that we really depend upon feelings of something. Yes. How, how, how do we, how will we be looking for something that only we can go by a, a spiritual emotion or a feeling of something? And it mentioned uh, that, that his, his, his coming, in other words, he was related as, as um, uh, unto us. Jesus mentioned, uh, I think, in the, in the scripture about, uh, about the Son of Man will come. And it was also so saying that if he would talk about himself, that he would have a knowledge of, uh, of him coming, of himself. He would know that day. He said that nobody knew the hour or the time of the Son of Man coming. So he, he evidently wasn't relating to himself when he made that statement. You know, he was talking about uh, another one, his, his father. So this prepared us for, for uh, a man that was coming. And he, he was a, a physical being at the time. So he also mentioned uh, about his father. Now, if he was a physical being, then at that time, he mentioned one greater, then we would also look for another uh, physical being to come into existence. Well, that's very clear. I mean, the messenger doesn't write very difficult language. It's very simple. And you have a good grasp, in my judgment, on what he's saying. The scripture says that the Son of Man will come. From the book of Genesis all the way into the New Testament, when it talks about the flood in the days of Noah, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of who? The Son of Man. Now that's mentioned in the Genesis. When you get into Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, the same thing is mentioned there. They were a, a very kind of sissified people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, they were warned by a prophet named Lot. And at the end of that warning it says, As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In the book of Matthew, Jesus 
tells us the direction of the Son of Man's coming and his purpose for coming bearing witness with Habakkuk. Habakkuk says he went forth for the salvation of his people. In the book of Matthew it says, as lightning shineth from the east even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, if the lightning is coming out of the east, striking the west, then he's saying that the Son of Man will come out of the east into the west. Now, Habakkuk says he went forth for the salvation of his people. In the book of Matthew it says, Wheresoever the eagles are gathered together, there shall the carcass be. What is the symbol of America? Uh-oh. What kind of bird is the eagle? It's a bird of prey. Is that right? Oh, brother and sister. You want to stop there a moment? And go to the board and, and peep at it a little bit? Now look. Thank you. You just Yeah, I got it. I don't want to pull this thing too much. Everybody all right? Good. Now, here we have the east. And the east is called the Orient. Is that right? And the west is called what? Occident, right? <laughs> that ain't no accident. <laughs> the people in the east are predominantly dark people. The people in the east are predominantly dark people. Or we say black people. People of the West are predominantly what? The predominant religion of the East or the Orient or the black people of that area is Islam. And the predominant religion of the people of the West is what? And the sign of the people of this religion is the crescent and the star. And the sign of the people of the West and their religion is a cross. Now, the black man of America was brought out of the West, out of the Orient, brought away from Islam, and brought into the West, the Occident, not an accident and brought under white rule and taught by them their religion and hung on the come on now let's look at it look at it now when you came from the east into the west did you go up or did you go down all right that's the question see if we were in the jungles with bones in our noses running around, climbing trees and carrying on, then you would say, we went up when we came here. But if you were a highly civilized individual, intelligent, knowing the sciences and whatnot, then you didn't leave the east to go up. You and I left the west and went where? Oh, brother, that's the scripture. Now, if you went down... Mm, 
in the West, under white folks, under their religion, on the cross. And the book says, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And the Son of Man, as Matthew describes him, as lightning shines out of the east, even unto the west, the Son of Man is coming in that same direction. Where is he going? To the land where the eagles are gathered together because there's a carcass there that God is after. Now the carcass is the remains of something that once was alive. I ask you, are we the remains of a once great and mighty nation? Are we a carcass now? Are we in our former glory or we are deprived of that former glory? Deprived, deprived of our former glory. Well, here we are now. Are we like the people in the days of Noah? Yeah. What were they doing when the flood came? Partying, boogieing, getting on down, dancing. What are you doing in 1980 when the price of gold just went up over $600 an ounce? The country is about to face internal ruin. What are you doing to prepare for it? We partying, we boogieing, we getting on down. What were they doing in Sodom and Gomorrah? They were sissies. They were having freaky parties. What are you doing in America? You doing the freak. Freaky deaky. So you haven't gone up, you went down. And the son of man's job is to find the brother in the west and return the brother who is lost back where? To himself in the east. Now that son of man, he got to be very powerful because he got to break the barrier that the West has on the black man. Now I'm going to put this over here, this word, Negro. Isn't that what we were called? Some of us still use that name, Negro. What does the name mean? Does it really? They say Negro means black, right? In what language? Okay. But black in what sense? When you're talking about color, and you're talking about a human being, you don't ever use the word negro. When you're talking about some inanimate object, some object that has no life in it, black shoe, then you say negro zapato. Right? I hope I got that right. Why is this a negro zapato? Because that shoe is black, but it's also dead. Because it can't move unless my living foot is in that shoe, then that shoe moves. But what about black man, negro? See, they're not giving you a, a real honorable name. Because if they were talking to you in terms of your color, they would use the term moreno. And whenever you find people who speak Spanish, Talking about living people of color, they use the word moreno. But when they use negro, uh-oh, you're in trouble. Because they're not talking about blackness here. They're talking about darkness here. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made us to see and understand that if you break this word negro down, which you should, it breaks down into a Latin word, N-E-C-R-O, which is the prefix of many words, necrology, necromancy. What does it mean? Has something to do with the dead. Then when it comes from 
Nekro in Greek, N-E-K-R-O, it means the dead. And when you get it up in English and call it Negro, who are you talking about? The dead. How are you dead, brother and sister? That's awful to call you dead like that. And do it so subtly you don't even know they're talking about you. And then you talk about yourself, I'm a Negro. Me, I'm dead. And everybody know you did because you don't do living things. To live is to build. A living man is a man and woman that's active pursuing their own self-interest. We're not active pursuing our self-interest. We're active pursuing their self-interest. Son of man coming from the east even unto the west. Now, brothers and sisters, the scriptures say, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather you from the west. Now, I'm going to close this point and then we're going to read a little. Or, or pardon me, move on and then come back and read. Now, You see how America's talking about the hostages? How many hostages they say they got over there? They really don't know, huh? Some say 47, some say 50, right? But look at how that man is acting. Did you read Jack Anderson's column recently where Jack Anderson said that the United States government knew that the Iranians would attack and take over the embassy. So they moved out all their top people and left a lower level a group of people there, brought the Shah into America. And when they brought the Shah in, the expected thing that happened was that the embassy was taken over. But according to Jack Anderson, they expected that some of the Americans would have been killed in the takeover. And if some of the Americans had gotten killed in the takeover, it would have legitimized America going in. And if they went in, their job was to, according to Jack Anderson, was to overthrow the Khomeini regime and bring Shapur Bakhtiar back from England, set him as the ruler over Iran, and then in six months or so, bring the Shah's son and put the Shah's son in power. Isn't that something? Are they just telling on themselves? But now if you're uptight, if you're uptight about 50 hostages, how do you think God feels about 30 million hostages in the Western world. Look at this. Here's a man that admits he ain't got nothing for you to do, but won't let you go. Don't want you, nigga, but I don't want nobody else to have you either. Now that the Son of Man is coming to get me for what I did to you, I'm going to hold these niggas as a hostage between God and me. And if God get me, he's going to get his people too. So I'm going to mix them up with me. I'm, you don't realize it, but you're a hostage right now. A Cadillac driving, $150 suit wearing, cigar smoking, Cocaine sniffing, disco party, hostage. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> now, look, brother, this man is. <laughs> look here. Every time one of the hostages say, Come on, TV, our captors are treating us very lovely. <laughs> very lovely. Uh, uh, I, I want to read this Christmas card we're sending to Khomeini. 
and America says how wicked. It's a, it's a high degree of, of brainwashing that's going on over there. That's what it is. Anytime you do a, to a black man what has been done, I mean, actually, brother, you've been robbed. Them hostages is getting meals. They change their clothes. They living pretty good. Here's a dude, excuse me, a people that don't have their Eastern history, their Oriental background, their spirit and love of their blackness. They don't have their own religion, their own God, their own country, their own flag. They're over here and they think they're being treated well. They tell the world, oh no, everything is fine in America. Did you hear Vernon Jordan? He says, how dare Khomeini <laughs> release all those black ones? They should have kept them there with the white ones, <laughs> trying to separate us from white people. Oh, no, we're the same. Now, you know you must be blind and crazy. After all the hell you caught, you're the same as the people who snatched you, robbed you, ripped you off, didn't take an embassy, took a country, and got you a hostage. And know that the Son of Man has come after you. And know that it's time for your deliverance. And in order to keep you blind, they give you a white woman. Take her, man. Here, go on. He would have hung you yesterday. Many of us that grew up in the South, you know what I'm talking about. You couldn't even watch a white woman's clothes on the clothesline. <laughs> He may get you for reckless eyeballing. <laughs> now you got a white woman at home. Don't bring her to the class. <laughs> they say, baby, where you going tonight, darling? <laughs> oh, I'm going out with the boys. <laughs> he didn't tell her he come in here to learn about her. And when he get home, he look under them covers and take a good look at her. <laughs> look at her good, he, I smell something. Man. Don't smell just right. See, when your nostrils clean up, man, you'll be looking to get out from this hostage state that you're in. Okay, now let's go back and... Oh, well. All right. The next chapter was the origin of God as a spirit and not a man. Where did that teaching come from? Anybody make any notes on that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First, on page 9, it says, Well, we all knew that there was a God in the beginning that created all things and do know that he does. I'm sorry. Mr. Yakub taught his people to contend with us over the reality of God by asking. What page is this on, please? Page nine. Nine. Yes, sir. All right. Who created the heavens and the earth? Okay. My question is that if he was a man, how could he create the heavens and the earth? Question. If God is a man, how could he create the heavens and the earth? The greatest sign of the reality of God today is the Caucasian. Because he's a man. And he is admittedly a young man on our planet. But his desire to contend with God, to show himself equal to God, he has in the last 50 to 60 years grown knowledge-wise where he goes right into his laboratory and makes synthetic life now. What is he saying? I can do what you do, God. God put up the earth. He put up a few tons of stuff and make it orbit the earth. Skylab, I think he called it. Of course, it came down. But that don't stop him from trying. He says in a few years, he will be able to control the weather and make weather according to his own desire. And he's doing some of that right now as he did when they were fighting in Vietnam. If you remember, 
they made rain and made the Ho Chi Minh Trail a complete a mud. With advanced knowledge, brethren, you can create life. Because we only see man in this state that he's in now, we can't perceive and conceive of a man wise enough to create the universe. But brother, the Caucasian, as I study him, he helps me to know that man is able to do anything that he can conceive and believe he can, as the old saying go, achieve. And you in your lifetime have lived to see that on a very small scale. So with greater knowledge, what could man do? Greater thing. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, what I in, intended to say before that, you know, was that it was uh, good news to me that there was a religion that taught that God is a man. You know, that if it's something material, you can see it's not a school. You know, because as you yourself have said, there are religions that do in fact teach that. And uh, I happen to be one of those individuals that very rational. You know, trying to understand what's happening out there. Yeah. So, quite naturally, coming up like I have come up, you know, I'm very leery of any religion that teaches that it's such a case. So, I mean, I applaud uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for teaching otherwise that it is a material person, okay? But I still have problems uh, uh, with a man being able. Can you think of any other being that you could pin that on? I mean, in other words, in the realm of, of reality now, if you see an effect, you search for the cause. Now, what we've done, we've seen the universe. We don't see who caused it to exist. So we wonder who did all of this. And the, the greatest search has been on for God. And isn't it something that you have to come right back to yourself? Not yourself in the form, in the mind, and in the state that you're in, because recognize that we've been totally robbed of the knowledge of self. The white man admits today, some of his scientists, that civilizations existed on this earth that makes his present level of civilization look like savagery. He has said this. He has said, and the scriptures bear witness, there's nothing new under the sun. He says that men flew before. They just didn't use this kind of airplane, but men flew before. He has said that Telescopes were in existence long before they developed the telescopes. He admits that the pyramids and the Sphinx, no matter where his technology has gone, he still is baffled over how that pyramid was put there in the desert so mathematically and so astronomically correct that the very gravitational pull of, uh, of the earth and the stars, I mean, are in harmony to keep the balance of this thing. How could they have known these things? They had on TV a few weeks ago that in the quote-unquote jungles of Africa, there was a man there that apparently had no learning, but this man plotted the course of stars that were not in existence, that they hadn't seen, and these Western scholars listened to the man and found that the man, who was not a reader, the man was as accurate as their computer. 
Now, and it blew their minds. What the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying to us, beloved brothers and sisters, and I know it's difficult for us to just come up after having been taught all our life that all of this wonder called universe is created by a spook. And then you come to find out that really man is the creator, man is the sustainer, but it's not man on the level that you know man. It's supreme wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We can master the very forces of nature. Now, one last point on that. There is um, a, a, um, a newspaper article that I read. It was in the Tribune where... They had broken energy down and matter down to four small components, the smallest of which they now call a quark, Q-U-A-R-K. They said if they could ever discover how to unify those four um, tiny particles of matter, they would be able to reconstruct the entire universe. This is their scientists. Now, beloved brothers and sisters, what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is aiming at is take your mind out of the sky and just look at things and start studying how you can do it. And once you can put it in your mind that it can be done, then you will move toward the wisdom to do it again and again. But if you don't believe that it is in your realm to do this, you always leave that kind of achievement to somebody else. One last point. I, I, I play the violin. And um, when I was very young, my mother started me with the violin and they always told me that the violin was the hardest instrument in the world to play. By the time I was seven and eight, I was doing pretty well with the violin. But my teacher, though I excelled at playing the violin, there was something that was missing in the knowledge that that teacher gave me. Because in their own mind, even though I would bring credit to this teacher when I played on Horace Height or, or uh, Ted Mack and all these national TV shows, that man did not want to see a black man master what they call their hardest instrument. And I will never forget when I was on the, the national television uh, edition of the Ted Mack show, playing the violin, they asked me, check this out. What was your ambition? I was 13 years old. I said, I would like to master this violin even as Yasha Heifetz. Yasha Heifetz is one of the world's greatest Violinists. Now they, they said, this nigga. I mean, the nerve of this nigga. They didn't say that to me. But when they gave me my script, do you know what it said? I ran track also and I was quite fast. So here's what they said. I hope one day I'll be able to play as fast as I can run. You see that? Because they did not want a little black boy who could play to put the thought in the minds of those who would be listening and looking that a black man would even think in terms of mastering an instrument that a white man mastered with the equal mastery or superior mastery. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, they did not give me that knowledge. And when I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he told me that God is a man and he is of my own uh, uh, father, kith, kin, black like me. I said, what? When I could see a connection between the father of creation and myself, I immediately snatched that violin up. 
that this is something, man. This is matter. It ain't mind and matter. It's just matter. I am mind as well as matter and spirit. I should master this and any combination of these things. And brother, I only say that to say this. I can put it down for years and pick it up and run dudes off the stand with their instrument because I am its master. So if you think like a slave, you'll always be a slave. But when you read the teaching of Allah Elijah Muhammad, and this man makes you to know that God and you is the same essence, then you look at yourself and you say, well, I, not only I am somebody, you don't talk like that, somebody's too nebulous. I am God, and I can make things happen. I don't sit around wait for somebody else to make it happen. We make things happen. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, big field awaits the wide awake man to work out in. And one day he asked me, he says, brother, do you know who the wide awake man is? I said, no, sir. He said, the wide awake man is the man who understands the knowledge of God. And when you understand the knowledge of God and you are poor, ragged, hungry, naked and out of doors, you really don't understand because you can get up from where you are Apply the principles that make success. Be in harmony with the universal laws of God and you can move ahead and master everything that you survey. And these, this kind of spiritual message, white folks never want black folks to put their hand on. Right. That we are akin to God and can absolutely grow to be a master of the universe and all therein. Yes, brother, and even reproduce it. That's right. You can do it. You can do it. I only just beg. You to reason with Muhammad and look at your children. Our little children today come into the world, they look like they're just born gifted go to the piano and start playing go to the drum start playing I have little children grandchildren that I'm listening to and the things that I hear coming out of their mouth I said my God I said this is a whole new world I'm looking at and if you're going to limit your children by this crazy thinking that you have your children want to move, and you there limited. Oh, that's too heavy for you. That's too hard for you. Oh, no, child, don't get into that. Oh, oh Lord, no. <laughs> don't you talk like that. That child is a child of the Creator, and it can grow up to reflect the magnificence of God very easily. Just give it a push, and the best way to give it a push is for you to recognize that you are the people of God, and that you can do what you will to do. So make your will to be in harmony with his will. Thank you so much for your questions and your statements. And I want you to know that in this house, your critical analysis and any statement you make is as welcome as anything you say in harmony with what the messenger teaches. Because this is the way we grow. Not through argument, but through reasoning. Yes, sister. Okay, I just want to bring out a book that kind of talked on um, how I was created. And that was one of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's books, uh, Our Savior and the Rise. I have read the book in the turn and it has helped me to understand how God came about. But also, if you know the Bible and also the Holy Quran, God, when you refer to God, a lot of times they say we. So that lets you know right there that man works in connection with God and helps to create some of the things that are here on earth. And one of the men from earth created another man so that lets you know that he himself was a God who was created to create man. And that was one of our own brothers. So that lets us know that we can work together mentally and create a whole new universe ourselves mm. because of our mind power. Sister's right on it. I wish we, she could have said that on a microphone. 
that we can work together to create a whole new universe or a whole new world for our people. We don't have to continue to function under their way. Once you know who you are, you can begin to create a new way for yourself and your people. Yes, sister? Okay, I understand that we are chosen people, we are special people, but what I don't understand is why are we Yes. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that Allah, God, is self-created. If you say that somebody created him, then that person is greater than him. God, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, is self-created. And from himself, he created us, original man, in the same nature of himself. You are like a direct descendant of the creator. To me, that's ex all that the scripture is saying. I think that's what the whole life of Jesus is pointing out. That this man is a direct descendant of the creator. And he's raised to the position where he manifests to men. Look man, look at what you could become. See, I was born of a woman just like you. I lived in the world just like you. I fought against uh, opposition just like you. I overcame that opposition just like I hope you will. I allowed myself to be put in the hands of my enemies and the enemy thought he took my life. And it's very beautiful that he went down into hell and then went on up into glory. See, these are all truths if they're properly understood. All it's saying is that, look, Jesus was a man, a man just like you and me, came from the womb of a woman, but he was born to manifest God on an earthly plane so that man could see his own divinity. See, man, you don't, you're not supposed to walk around here worshiping Jesus, worshiping the prophets. You're supposed to see, wow, look at what's in him. The same that is in him is also in me. And that's why Jesus bid the people, come, follow me. But Jesus never put himself equal to his father. He always put the father first. And that's what we do. We put Allah first. And we are his direct descendant or to create or from the divine creator, the creator's people. And now we have to strive to be that, manifest that in everything that we say and do. I saw a sister over here and then I'll come to the brother. Yes. I'm going to make a statement on something that I noticed. Um, May I have a word? Neil Bird is dying from snow and let's all right people are dying from snow for that little festival. And uh, I just want to make sure add on like Dying for what? Dying for snow. Snow. For the winter festival. Oh. Okay. I noticed that, you know, it was it hasn't been snowing. The weather's been very nice. Okay, um, I'm a letter carrier. When I walk, you know, when I was a little girl, snow used to come down this place. And now it comes down a little white ball. You know, it's white, it's like little white balls. And that just goes, you know, I'm, it adds on to what you said about people can do what they want to do, you know, as far as uh, the white band or whatever, controlling the weather. Well, oh, I don't say he's controlling it, but I say he's attempting to do that. He hasn't mastered that yet, but he's attempting to do it. No, if he could control it, he wouldn't have dropped so much on himself last year. <laughs> somebody's dropping it on him <laughs> and if he is able if he feels in a few years he'll be able to do that 
then our question should be, who is doing that now? The Son of Man, as the book says, he's in the world. Now there's um, a few things that I'll bring out later as we close our meeting uh, that uh, will come back on Brother's question and help to tie in that question with everything that's been said. Uh, Brother Massey, I hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, you made a statement in reference to uh, Cuba. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, my sister was in Cuba for about uh, three months, and she said that the way they changed the education literacy was to take the children, and when they came home from work every evening, they would have the children teach the adults. That's correct. And the adult had to report it to the child every day for his education lesson. And if he did not report his education lesson, he had problems with the government. Well, in some cases that is true. When I was there, they told me that many of the young people that could read, they sent them up into the hills to teach those who could not read. And uh, brothers and sisters, until we get that kind of spirit among ourselves, we don't want to see one black person in this country, if they're 90 years old, they cannot read. And it becomes our duty to help our people to read because reading opens up a whole new world for our people. Yes, brother. Uh, the second uh, statement I want to ask you about, uh, do you think it is uh, possible to, like, you can reach around when you step outside of your physical body? Mental. You can dissociate the mental from the physical. But um, I think it's possible to travel mentally also. Yes. Brother, ask a question. Is it possible for you to step outside of your body and travel and whatnot? Now, this may sound far fetched. I don't like to go into things that are too far beyond maybe our development at this time. But I, I know that this can be done. I know that this can be done. I have experienced this myself. And I don't say this that I'm any unusual person because I'm not. But brothers and sisters, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us <clears throat> that the brain cell is created to think right. The creator never created the mind to think unlawful. Whenever you think rebellious against divine order, you're thinking against the nature in which the brain cell is created. Therefore, you are damaging the mind. Every time you think contrary thoughts, you are damaging your own ability to vision. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us that when we are in a very righteous state, we can hear each other think. That's not hard. There are some today who are beginning to do that actually tune right up on you. Do you know that your brain sends out waves? Right? And if another man's mind is tuned up to be able to pick up the oscillation of the brain waves produced by your thoughts, he can actually hear you think and tell you what you are thinking. And not only can he do that, but see, the white man being on the plane that he's on, he uses telephone and uh, radio and television. It's the same principle, but it's a lower principle. It's on, on, a, on a, a material level. But when you get into the higher spiritual development, brother, not only can you travel, but you can bring that which you want to see to you through pictures. Now, this may sound way out, 
But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that this is what the gods do. When you get to your righteous state, that'll be like nothing to you. And sometimes if you just get quiet long enough and think deep enough, your sensitivity will start rising. Some of you right now have gotten glimpses of your own spiritual powers when you can think on something. You say, wow, somebody's in trouble. Somebody real close to you and you can see it and feel it. And you get on the phone, you make a call, and exactly as you saw it is exactly as it happened. Now, what is that? See, that is your psychic ability that each one of us has that comes through every now and then. You know, the, the fellow that plays the numbers and has the dreams, and I'm not trying to encourage that. But, brother and sister, some of our folk can dream and vision and see. And some of us can actually have had out of the body experiences where the body is here and the mind has traveled out and visioned what they have never seen in real life and actually have a picture of cities, of things that they could never have seen except they traveled there and their bodies didn't go but they went. Now, I mean, brother and sister, when we grow mentally, morally, and spiritually, you will have experiences like this, and, and, and you'll see that you have powers that you have never tapped. And black people, oh my Lord, haven't you met black women and men among us who have that ability? I have. I've met brothers and sisters among us that actually have that gift can tell you what tomorrow is going to bring. That's because that's their gift from God. And if you keep yourself pure and in a righteous order, you will manifest that gift more and more. I'm coming for someone higher than himself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Question number one, you style yourself as the national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You speak, uh, it seems to suggest that you believe that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is alive and that he will return. I want to know, do you believe that Elijah Muhammad is to return. Second question, do you see your role in rebuilding the nation of Islam uh, scripturally? And third, what are your numbers? I'll take the third one first. Well, as you know, my brother, there are many, many people who were affected by the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and loved his work. And many, after seeing the changes, went into many, many different directions. In all honesty and candor, I really don't know how many followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad there are still left, or how many of those that are left are with Brother Farrakhan. But this is a period of darkness and confusion. But as I look around the country, I see Muslim activity now emerging, re-emerging all over the country. All of this Muslim activity does not necessarily mean that they are with Brother Farrakhan. That's right. But it does mean that the Muslims recognize a responsibility to continue the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In that regard, we believe 
that as time goes on, you will see that which is called splinter groups of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad merging like streams into a river. That's right. And you will see the nation again as one nation. And I don't think it would be wise at this point to even talk about the actual numbers that I know are with me, because then that gives our enemies too much information. All right? Second question, which is your first question. I will tell you the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad directly to my face. He said to me, I'm four. Brother, I am going away. He said, I will be gone approximately three years. He said, I'm going away to study. Listen to his word carefully. To study. Now he gives me orders. He says, brother, don't you change the teachings while I'm gone. And if you are faithful, when I return, I will reveal the new teachings through you. Now, If you were to look on your television this morning and you saw Christian ministers preaching, some of the most scholarly and intelligent of them believe that the return of Christ is imminent and they believe that the man who was killed 2,000 years ago is alive and will return. I believe the same. I can't tell you that I always thought that way, but I believe that you are in and the world is in for great surprise. Those who think that they have gotten rid of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. Do you expect his return? Yes. I am a sign in your midst of his return. I was struck with the same death of hypocrisy that the whole nation went under except for a few. But I'm back. And I am alive. Right. And the nation is coming back now. Right. Right. And it is alive and viable. Let's look at these brothers again. They're cleaning up from the filth of the world. Their teacher is not present yet. They have not, some of them have never seen his face. Right. But they are coming alive by the power of his word. The nation will return. And he will also. Second question and last question. Do you see yourself in scripture? Definitely. If the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is written of in scripture from one end of the scripture to another, how could his spokesman not be in the book? But it is not for me to go into where Brother Farrakhan is in the book because Brother Farrakhan is not to represent himself. He's a representative of his teacher. And so my job is to make my teacher's great commission known. And he told me, and these are his words, he said, Brother, you don't have to worry about where you are in the scripture. 
make my great commission known and I will represent you to the people. And so I'm not concerned about whether you know where Farrakhan is in the scripture, but I am concerned if you locate the master teacher, you will locate his students. But your eyes shouldn't be on his students. Your eyes should be on the teacher. So I answer that in that, on that wise, because I don't, by the help of Allah, I don't ever care to go into scriptures to point out where I think we are. I mean, I am. No, I think that's vanity. And it's self-conceit. Even if it's true, I don't think I should utter it. You know why? Because if the lights are out in this building and a man says he's the electrician and the lights stay out, by the lack of the activity of turning on the lights, you know that that cat was not the electrician. That's right. But if you say the lights are out, is there an electrician in the house? And a man stands up and does the work of putting the lights back on when you know they've been out, then he don't have to tell you who he is. His wife bears witness yes, of him. So I will never say it from my mouth, but I will tell you, brother, watch what I do. My works will testify of me. Yes, sir. Now, I'm going to say this about where we are. When Jesus went to the cross, all the disciples felt the master was dead. Peter, his chief disciple denied him and for three days the disciples were scattered lost and did nothing but on the third day Mary and Martha met Peter and told him the tomb is empty the master is gone Peter didn't believe it. He had to be shown. He still was in doubt. But by the time the disciples got together in the upper room, the very man that was in question as to whether he was alive or dead showed up. Now, if that's in the scriptures, what is it there for and who does it fit? Oh, brother, the world is in for a surprise. That's right. And I'm saying to you who are Muslims, I don't know how the messenger could have taught us so well on everything else and made such a mistake about himself. He didn't make no mistakes. That man didn't make no mistakes. That's right. And that's why I'll tell you this. He asked the followers to keep the eye on the brother, meaning myself, that's and right. to listen to the brother. That's right. That's right. He said that. Right. And I'm going to tell you why he said it. Because the more you watch the brother, and I mean, I don't care how you watch me, you can watch me with a critical eye, eye of, uh, I'm going to check that nigga. I don't care what you got in your mind, just keep your eye on the brother. And when the God get finished working with the brother, you're going to know that the same power that was with Elijah Muhammad is with your brother. You're going to see that. There's no bragging. This is no bragging, brother. And I say this again to those who in whose hearts is a disease and they think that Farrakhan wants to be a big shot. Do you know how hated Elijah Muhammad was and is in this society? Do you think if I just wanted to make some money 
that I could find a better way to do it than to stand up and represent a man and a teaching that the government sought for 40 years to destroy and work night and day, sent agents in to incite people to kill people all in the nation of Islam to destroy this house? Do you think if I was some dude that was playing a game that I would pick up the messenger's teaching and teach it exactly as he gave it without adding to or taking away from? Do you think that it's, it, it's, a, it's something that a man would do who wants to trick and deceive the people? I know if God ain't with me, I am dead saying the things that I'm saying. But I also have his assurance that the God is with me. That's right. And those who try to do me harm, watch and see the harm that comes to them. All right. I'm in your midst, brother, right now, daring the hypocrites and the disbelievers and the devil, come on and attack me. Come on. I ain't got no army, but attack me. If you want to die, that's the quickest way to do it. That's right. Because I am a reminder to a people of a man of God who laid down a perfect message for our salvation. Right. And then nobody is going to kill the reminder. Come on now. That's right. I'm just saying that I'm not bragging and I'm not boasting. But I tell you of a surety, brother, that you will soon see that God's power is back in your little brother. Yeah? So my dear brothers and sisters, and brother, especially, thank you for your question. I tried to answer you as honestly, candidly as I could without revealing things that I don't think I should reveal at this time. Yes, dear brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brothers, question. Young brothers from 17 to 24, did you say? 27. To 27 are coming out of prison. And the prisons, are, as you know, are now filled with young people. His question is, are you going to tailor a teaching for the young brothers who are coming out of prison to get them up into righteousness? And my answer to you is, yes, my brother. The greatest generation that this people has ever produced is right now that generation from 17 right. to 27. I don't have to tailor make a teaching for you. You are tailor made for the teaching of Muhammad. Your mother and father may have been a believer in Islam, but it didn't fit them too well. They didn't shape up in it like they should because they weren't made really for the garment. That's why the Bible says of the old generation that followed Moses, they had to wander in the wilderness till they died out and the young ones came up and inhabited the promised land. What I'm saying is, you, you, did you hear what I, my whole lecture, here's young youngsters sitting down, but 90% of these young brothers and sisters understood this message with clarity. And it is no problem for them to understand this. Don't none of these children go to church and sit up attentive like this without organ playing, music singing, people popping, jumping, dancing. But here's a word, and these young minds have grasped that word, and they say, man, this is what I've been looking for. This is it. Because you are tailor-made for the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We will be working in all of the prisons, and in many of the prisons we are working right now. But many of the prison authorities don't want to see that militant program of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad inside the prison come back, but it's coming back whether they like it or not. 
Yes, brother, there'll be so much hell inside the prison and so much hell on the streets that the devil is not going to have room in his prison for the people who are committing crime, so he's going to have to open the door and let some of them that's inside out. And you know who he's going to let out first? The civilized brother who has learned the law of civilization. Once you submit to a law, brother, and submit to the divine laws of God, you are already in the realm of respect for the laws of man. And after a man is civilized like that, he doesn't deserve to be behind bars. No black man that is sent to prison is actually guilty. He did the act, yes, but he's not really guilty. He lives in a criminal society that has criminally dealt with the black man and forced him into criminal activities by depriving him of the knowledge of self, the knowledge of everyone else, equality of opportunity to express himself, especially the black man. That's right. Yes, brother, we're going to be in the prisons. Jam up. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. And your third question. You know, first, before I answer your question or repeat your question, I want to say, brother, as I saw you sitting there, I really admired your spirit and your countenance. And uh, you were you were not 20 yet, are you? 19. His question was number one. Brother, do you have a tape on back there? I hear some talking. Now, brother's question is, in Malcolm X's book, Malcolm accuses the Honorable Elijah Muhammad of committing adultery. And he says in his book, six months prior to that time, he told a minister, Louis X, of Boston about it, which, of course, is Brother Louis Farrakhan. And he wants my answer to the charge of Malcolm X against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Second, is Master Farad Muhammad a white man or is Master Farad Muhammad an Indian? Right? Your first question. I'm very knowledgeable by Allah's grace of Malcolm. I was a student under him for nine years. In that same book, he tells you that he loved Brother Lewis more than he loved his own brother. That's how close we were. I loved Malcolm so much, brother, that I would have given my life for him at any time during those nine years that I was a student under him. But there would come a time when Wallace Muhammad, the present leader of the Nation of Islam, would accuse his father of adultery and that he accused his father to Minister Malcolm who was a minister at that time. Right. And this germinated in Malcolm's mind, this charge of adultery germinated in Malcolm's mind where he grew to disrespect his teacher. In December, I'm sorry, November of 1963, 
when Malcolm X, I'm sorry, when uh, John Kennedy was assassinated, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was scheduled to speak at the Manhattan Center in New York City. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at that time declined to come. Malcolm wanted to speak. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad warned all of his followers, don't say anything with respect to the death of Kennedy. During that day, Malcolm got through his speech all right. That evening, Malcolm made the statement at a question and answer period that it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. When the New York Times blew this up in the uh, press at a time when the uh, American people were in shock and in anger over the assassination of President Kennedy, who really, in my judgment, history's judgment, was the most charismatic of all of the American presidents, loved very much by the American people and by black people especially. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was very displeased with Malcolm because Malcolm endangered by his statement the whole nation of Islam by allowing the anger, the hatred of the people to turn on Muslims because the spokesman seemed to mock the death or assassination of the president. So to save Malcolm and us, the messenger sat Malcolm down, number one, because he was disobedient to the instructions of his teacher. And Malcolm, like all of us knew, that when the messenger gave us an order, that order should be carried out. That's right. And Malcolm disobeyed and was punished. When Malcolm was sat down, or silenced, I was the brother who took Malcolm's place in New York the first week that he was silenced. And after I spoke that day, Malcolm took me home to his house where Betty Shabazz, his wife, cooked dinner for him and for me. And during that conversation that Malcolm had with me, as he writes it in the book, he told me that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had fathered children from some of his secretaries. He looked at me as he told me this, and then he said to me, What do you think, brother? And as God is my witness, my answer to him was, I think there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. I said, brother, I have to go. My mind was tore up. Malcolm took me to the airport, and while we were on our way to the airport, LaGuardia Airport, Malcolm said to me, now don't tell anybody what I said to you. And I looked at Malcolm and said, no, sir, I'm not going to tell anyone but the messenger. I went home to my little house in Boston. My wife, who sits here on the front row, was asleep, and I looked at her, and I said, oh, she's so lucky. She can sleep. I couldn't sleep that night. I felt I was going out of my mind. Here's my teacher that taught me righteousness, taught me uh, to obey the divine law, now charged with breaking the very law that he taught me to uphold. Well, my brother, I prayed that night harder than I think I've ever prayed and asked the God just to let me go to sleep. And he did. I slept. Five o'clock that morning, the phone rang, and it was Malcolm. And he hear his words to me. He said, Brother, 
I wish that you would delay the letter that you're going to write to the messenger so that I may get a letter off to him and explain to him why I told you. My answer to Malcolm was, Brother, I'm going to, no, I said, Brother, my head is so messed up, it's going to take me some time to get that letter together. So if in that time you can get your letter off and explain yourself, that's fine. I said, but I don't want to be in, caught in between a struggle between two wise men. Malcolm said to me, there's only one wise man. And I said, I'm very well aware of that, brother. But he was a very wise student. And a wise student is not the wise man. Brother, that ended that conversation. That morning, I went into my study and I said to Allah, Allah, if this is true, it has to be written in the book. I said, if he's the last of the messengers, he has to fulfill everything that is written of the messenger. It's got to be in the book. I opened my Holy Quran to the 30th third chapter and if you have a holy Quran brother you go home open your Quran up to the 33rd chapter it's a chapter called the allies the allies and in that chapter as I began to read I began to read of the wives of Muhammad and in the footnotes it began to talk about what the Christian missionaries said of Muhammad because God permitted him to marry up to nine women. This is the prophet of Islam in Arabia. And one of them was a young girl named Aisha who was 11 years old when she married the prophet of Islam. But the Christian missionaries in their vile, vulgar, low down, cheap mind, accuse Prophet Muhammad of being a voluptuary, meaning a womanizer and a woman chaser. And this is written, brother, you can check this out in any of your libraries. This is what the Christian missionaries said of Muhammad of Arabia. I said, this is it. I had about $30 left to my name. I called Malcolm back. I said, brother, I've got something to talk to you about. I can't talk about it on the phone. Will you be in town? He said, yes. I said, I'm coming over. I spent my last $30. It was $14 at that time, round trip on a shuttle from Boston to New York. Malcolm met me at the airport and we began to ride and I told him what I read in the Holy Quran and I'm going to tell you Malcolm's words. He said, I know it, brother, but you can't teach it. You can't handle it. He said, I will teach it. I said, yes, sir. Now, what does that mean? That means that whatever is in the messenger's life, it ain't something that we can hide. His life is an open book, but Everything in his life can be defended by the divine law, by the scriptures, and by the history. But because the Muslims didn't know how to defend it, it became a great trial for the Muslims. Now notice the chapter that is found in 33 and it's found again in 66. Now I'm going to, by Allah's help, give you the science of it. I just want you to know that by Allah's help, I'm well prepared for this hour. <laughs> and I can defend the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in any court 
anywhere in the world, brother, that's an innocent man, but the people have corrupted themselves in their vile interpretation of what the scripture called brute beast knowledge. That's right. Now hear me. Two threes. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that the number three represents a number of trial. You see the word three? In three, you have the number triad, which is in music, a triad is three notes, right? You have trio, three people playing together. Trio. It all is under the number three. There are two threes mentioned because that means that that which the chapter is talking about is going to come up twice and in the both times it comes up it's going to be a trial for the Muslims and a separation of the Muslims. That's right. Come on. When it came up with Malcolm. Now here's where Malcolm and I fell out. Malcolm and I had the same knowledge, but this little brother didn't give it a brute beast, filthy interpretation as Malcolm did. Malcolm was so hurt out of his stumble from the seat of authority and power that he had because he was the most powerful black man in this country next to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. And he felt in his heart that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was jealous of him and wanted to get rid of him. And that feeling in Malcolm was the thing that caused Malcolm to stumble. And when Malcolm stumbled, he became very vindictive against his teacher and came on Cups and Nets show right here in Chicago, across the country, saying that Elijah Muhammad I believed in him more than he believed in himself. He started talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in such a filthy way, he inflamed every follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who desired to take his life. And then the government stepped in and moved and manipulated and Malcolm was assassinated. Behind Malcolm's assassination, everybody all right? I'm taking the time to answer brother's question because he raised a good question that's in a lot of people's minds. Beloved brothers and sisters, listen. Behind what Malcolm said about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Muslims became divided. Some Muslims believed Malcolm went with Malcolm, others stayed with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Some stayed in the temple in doubt because Malcolm was so profound and so powerful. He had an effect on our community. All right, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us that one would come up that would make Malcolm's work look like a baby. Am I lying? I know all of you thought it was Farrakhan, so you had your eyes glued on Farrakhan, but Wallace snuck right up out of the loins of the messenger and he has said about his father that which makes what Malcolm said look small. Am I lying or am I telling the truth? All right. Now here it is because it's all written in the book. The second time it comes around, it comes around worse than the first time because it comes around after the messenger is gone and he's not here to defend himself. That's right. So when it comes down, it shatters the Muslims. Look at the filthy interpretation. Yeah, he had a lot of women around. As to make those of us as men who know what it's like to be married and running after a lot of different women, we would put the messenger in that kind of category. So what does that do? You start excusing yourself for the things that you've been 
desiring to do, but now the gates are open. Well, if the Lamb of God did all of that, hell, I can go on and get me a few on the side. So the brothers went to doing what they wanted to do. All them little virgin girls in the Muslim girls training class went on out and got knocked up, went crazy. That's right. Am I lying? No, sir. no, I'm not lying. Brothers went back to selling dope, doing everything evil, and in the back of their mind they're saying, I was tricked because that man made me live right and then he was living wrong. I say to your brother, you don't understand, the man was right all the way down the line. That's right. Now look, the second time it comes up, the 66th chapter. What did I tell you? The clock was set on? Right. Six. And in that chapter 66, it talks about the doom of the hypocrites. Because what Wallace B. Muhammad has done is separated and weeded out the nation of Islam. Right. Because all of those hypocrites who were in the nation jiving, saying they loved the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and now Wallace has separated the house. Right. Those that love him like a piece of fat back, yeah. you put it on you in the drawers, all the pus and filth and funk out of you. Well, that's what he's done. He's drawn the filth and the funk out of the house, and now the house is divided and in a state of war. Right. And this is the end, because there ain't going to be no more hypocrites after Wallace goes down. No more. And I'm telling you that the God is set now. And you're going to see this with your eyes because he intends to make an example of Wallace and all his followers for the world to see that you don't play with God and you don't play with God's messenger. That's right, that's right. Now, Malcolm got something. But God was even merciful to Malcolm in death because even though Malcolm was shot, he died. And his name lived. Wallace is going to live to see that which he desired to destroy come right back and eat him up. Because you cannot destroy the will of God. Now if you, I mean it ain't over yet. No, sir. The devil is going to pick it up. Right. He's going to pick it up. And when he see the nation, look at him, brother. For years, he wouldn't even talk about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It was like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died, man. Nobody mentioned his name. It just hush, hush. Nobody talk about him. Don't say nothing. Jet Magazine, don't write nothing. Nobody say nothing. Right. Now that the trumpet is blasting his name again, the world is getting shook now. Right. So they're going to bring back the filth and just lace it over the people. But when they do... We got something for them. That's right. And I just say this to the white man straight on up and his imps that are in here. We have a lesson about uh, you, talking to white folks. In the student enrollment, you are called the skunk of the planet Earth. And I don't realize Muhammad never told you why the God called you a skunk. So when you get started with your urine, we have an antidote for your funk. Now I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. One of these days, brother and sister, I will teach this by Allah's help in such a way where you will understand it so clear. Honest to goodness, it's such a beautiful thing that God caused to happen. I'm just going to say this to you and let it go. How many families did Job have? Come on. You don't know. Job had two families. The first family of Job got destroyed. But God gave him a second family that was better than his first family. Now, if you think that the army, look at all the work that the army Elijah Muhammad did for 44 years. And who was the beneficiaries of that work? His family. Right. 
They didn't want for nothing under his roof. Which one of the family members have upheld the father's name who suffered to make them what they are? Not one! But he got a second family and they love him and they never was with him like the first family but they know him! Right. And you're going to hear from them. That's right. God is not mocked. Just like there's a second group that's coming up now of Muslims that will be greater than the first. The family of the messenger is a sign. A second family coming up greater than the first. A second group coming up greater than the first. That's right. Oh, brother, you're going to see it all. So I'll leave that for now. Because just so much in it, and even why, you know, Allah made me, you know, I won't. Allah made me to understand why the number nine. And I sat at the messenger's table one day and I said to him, I said, dear apostle, I know why the God allowed Muhammad to have nine wives. He said, shh, shh. He didn't want me to say that. Not at that time. When this stuff started coming up, I made a tape on it and sent it to the messenger. And the messenger sent for me out in Phoenix. He said, oh, my brother. He said, I wish that my son could understand this like you. And he sat down and he taught me into the depth of not only what happened, but why it happened. And one day, I will talk about it or teach on it, because it's all lessons, okay? Now your second question was, was Master Farah Muhammad white or was he an Indian? He was neither. He was neither. He appears white. Would you stand up, Brother Leon? Now look well at Brother Leon. Brother Leon looks white, but he's not white. Right. He's our brother. Right. Now, thank you, brother. When Master Farad Muhammad came among us, he came looking something like Brother Leon. Right. Why he come like that? Because the scripture said he would come as a thief in the night. As a thief, who's the thief that stole you? He's the Caucasian. If he's going to come like the thief, he's going to come looking like the thief so he could slip in among the thief and get you out of the clutches of the thief by raising up a messenger and then moving on out. The scripture said, oh, old Christians have a song, prepare me a body that I may go down. He's not white. He's half original. Half original means he's part of that nation a race and part of us. He had to be a part of both to take part of the nature of both because that's the nature of the time in which we live. One time is great and the other part of it is dreadful. It's a time to love, but it's also a time to hate. It's a time to heal, but it's also a time to kill. And the man who had to do both things at the same time had to have that kind of nature so he's prepared. That's, what the, that's why he's called the son of man. He's a man from a man prepared to deliver the black man. Right. Is that clear? He's not an Indian. I know why Wallace D. Muhammad says he's an Indian. Because there's a dude out on the West Coast named Muhammad Abdullah who is 60 some years old, a Pakistani, that they were preparing to, to say to the Muslims that he was Master Farad Muhammad. But he better not come out the closet. Why are you seeing this, Farrakhan? Because in 1964, Almighty God, Allah, gave me a vision of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I'm going to tell you just what he allowed me to see. There I am in my bed in Boston. But all of a sudden, my mind is traveling out in space. 
and I'm right around the messenger's window and I see the messenger sitting on the bed silhouetted against the moonlight in Wallace D. Muhammad's room and he's crying a sob like I never heard before and he's saying over and over again, my son, my son, my son. And when I woke up, I knew what it was then I went into scripture and I found it there in the book. And I was trying to comfort the messenger, saying to him, don't worry, I'll be your son. I'll be your son. But he never would look at me because he didn't want no other son. He wanted Wallace. He wanted Wallace to do the job. He wanted Wallace to be the man that would lead and work this work. But Wallace was jealous of his father right. and hated his father right. and hated the God of his father right. and hated the teachings of his father. Right. Right. So he's become an unprofitable son. Surely man is in loss. You see them losing everything over there that the father built because God is not with it. Right. And would have killed me if God did not protect my life. That's right. But by Allah's help, not vindictive, we will rebuild. That is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's flesh and blood, and I respect that, and I will obey the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings, and will not let none that are with Brother Farrakhan do no harm to no member of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family, because not one of us are their judges. Right. That judge is on the way back. And they are be in for surprise when the scripture says, The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. But who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. He's on his way. And I tell you, brother, it ain't going to be no joy to the world that the Lord has come. All right. It's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I thank you so much for listening and bearing patiently with me this afternoon. I, I didn't mean to get carried away, but I feel what I know very deeply because of my experience. It's been the most brutal and painful period of my entire life. But I thank Almighty God Allah that he's bringing the Muslims up and out of it forever, never to return to that again. So may Allah bless you and keep you, guide you and protect you as I greet you and thank you so much for your patience. Assalamu alaikum.